Myers. I'm currently affiliated with Oxford University, but mainly independent environmental consultant. Um, Norman's, Norman's had five different careers during this uh, so far. He started out as a colonial administrator in Kenya. And then when Kenya became independent, he became a high school teacher there. And then he became a professional photographer and later a journalist all this in Kenya. And then finally decided that he better go back to school and got a PhD in um, interdisciplinary studies from Berkeley. Um, and since then he's been um, largely operating as an environmental consultant doing interdisciplinary kinds of environmental research at a time when that was not really uh, as popular as it has become now. Uh, and he's consulted with places like the White House, the State Department, NASA, the World Bank, the UN, done all kinds of interesting studies. If you were here for his talk um, last night, he talked about species extinctions and um, species hotspots, one of the major pieces of work that he's been involved with. And today he's going to talk about um, perverse subsidies. And he's recently written a book on perverse subsidies, which I have a copy of in the year and take a look at. Um, he's won uh, several prizes over the years, uh, including the Blue Planet Prize, the UN Environmental Prize, and he's also a uh, commander of St. Michael and St. George in England, which he tells me is one step down from being a, a, a knight. So I'm not familiar with these arcane things they have over there. <laughs> Evidently, he, he did some good things for that in order to get that. Uh, so we're uh, happy to have him. Before, before I turn it over to Norman, let me just make one quick announcement uh, that there will be a performance of Beat the Heat, which is a musical comedy about global climate change, uh, at 8 p.m. tonight in the UVM Recital Hall on the Redstone campus. So make that one if you can. And, <clears throat> oh yes, and <laughs> just to remind you one more time, for those of you who haven't been coming to this lecture series, that the uh, Questions at the end. We'll pass out those slips of paper during the, during the talk. If you would write your questions down on the slips of paper, pass them uh, to the aisles at the end, and we have a panel of student inquisitors who will uh, synthesize those questions and ask them to uh, Dr. Myers after, after the talk. So about 45 minutes approximately for the talk, and about 30 minutes then for the questions. Okay. Thanks very much, and welcome, Norman. Thank you, Bob. Good morning, folks. Glad to be with you again. Uh, in his introduction, well, put, put it this way, uh, Bob mentioned that, that I did an interdisciplinary degree at the University of California, Berkeley. The day when I learned most while at Berkeley was my final day. I went to my uh, supervisor, Bob, a certain Arnold Schultz, uh, to say goodbye and thanks and so on, and he said to me, uh, what did I think was the most important thing I'd learnt while at Berkeley? I knew Arnold fairly well, so rather, rather tongue-in-cheek, I said, in response to that, I said the most important thing was how to outwit the system. And he said, you couldn't have learned anything more important than that, could, could you? And I've, I've, I've borne, that, borne that in mind uh, since, since Berkeley, how, how to outwit the system. Now, this talk is going to uh, look at uh, perverse subsidies, which are a huge roadblock in enabling the, in allowing the system to, to work better than it does, creaking along. And then, then we'll have a look at uh, various other sorts of institutional roadblocks, all of them uh, geared to slowing down the system, uh, make, make it grind up, and so on and so on. So anyway, uh, that's on the first slide. I'm going to rattle through these slides rather quickly. Uh, I shan't go into every last uh, statistic on, on the screen, uh, but if you want to follow them up at your leisure, They'll, tomorrow they'll be on the website of the Gund Institute, www.uvm.edu, G-I-E-E. -E. That's tomorrow. Uh, this is my logo, our Earth is one, plainly enough, our world is not. That's the opening sentence of the Brunton Commission report way back in 1985. Uh, the green arrows around the globe indicate that this is a single unitary planetary ecosystem. The winds carry no passports, pollution goes from one country, um, and so on and so on. That's uh, pretty apparent, I should think. And let's have a look at one particular environmental problem and see why it's not working out better, and that is water shortages. The yellow blocks indicate the situation in 1990 
when 550 million people in the world were short of water. It is predicted that by the year 2025, just down the road, that number will swell to uh, 3 billion. 550 million was one person in 10 of all humankind. Uh, 3 billion will be two people out of five of all humankind, quite a large proportion. And these people really are short of water. They have no more to serve all their needs throughout the day, that is cooking, wa washing, sanitation. They have no more than we use every time we flush the toilet. They really are short of water. And you might say, well, well why on earth does anybody run short of water? Water is an intrinsically renewable resource. We should be able to send it round time after time. In fact, it said if you live in Manhattan and you get a glass of water out of a tap, it's likely to have been through three human beings already. But well, water can be, can be recycled if at all indefinitely, uh, but it's not. Cost of water shortages, it's, this is rather clinical way of saying, you know, what, what it costs cost the economy, uh, but, but it is one way of shadow pricing or getting a proxy valuation of what happens when people are short of water. You know, the top amount of developing nation water, the disease due to lack of clean water, 90%. You know, uh, malaria, bilharzia, schistomiasis, diarrhea, long line of diseases that are, that are right because of lack of clean water. Annual cost of work days, loss of sickness, $125 billion. That means that it is really a very serious thing. It's not just a case of people being thirsty and uncomfortable. It does cost the, the, the economy. Another way of proxy pricing. Uh, in many countries, women and children spend several hours of the day in hiking beyond the horizon to go and go, go to a source of decent water, bring it back home. They could be spending that time in their crop fields growing crops. You can put a value on that, let's say 50 cents an hour, which they could have been earning in their crop fields, but instead of that, there's an opportunity cost lost in seeking water, and that would work out about $175 billion a year. So put the two together, a total of $300 billion. Uh, now, the question is, why? why are there water shortages? Why don't governments institute whatever's need be to engage in massive recycling schemes? Well, the, the main reason is that governments all around the world engage in massive subsidization of water supplies. They, they don't actually hand over cash to people, but when they supply water to consumers, whether in the household or industry or on farms, governments do not charge the full cost of supplying the water, not by a long, long way. You know, to the top. Well, Israel charges 60%, it's doing fairly well, but a long way to go there. Of course, Israel does it, because if, if it didn't do that, the country would be wiped off the map. But note, Egypt. There's no country in the world which is more dependent on a single natural resource than Egypt is dependent on the River Nile. And you'd think that they would lock, look after that water, get maximum work and efficiency out of every last drop of Nile, Nile water. But on the contrary, if you go to Cairo in the middle of summer when the temperature is 100 degrees, you'll, and you go to a government department, you'll see in the grounds outside, in the gardens, there'll be big uh, water spurs going round and round, midday sun, Almost all of that water jumps straight back into the sky, it serves no, no purpose. It, it's wasted. It's wasted because the price is so artificially cheap due to the covert government subsidies, and people get the message that whatever the environmental alarmists might say about water being scarce, in fact it must be so cheap you can use it as wastefully as you wish. Otherwise the water wouldn't be so cheap. It's a totally wrong message. No, even in the United States, 17%. If governments were to phase out these water, these crazy water subsidies, then that would pass a message to the consumer to use the water carefully, sparingly, efficiently, as productively as possible, and use it time after time. Very few countries do that, but here's the, here's the better news. There are some countries like uh, China, uh, South Africa, Mexico, which are slowly ratcheting up the price of water supplied until it'll be 100 percent of the cost of supplying the water, and people will, will learn then to use water much more carefully. That's an example of a subsidy, albeit, albeit a, a, a covert or hidden subsidy. It's one of those uh, perverse subsidies which we'll look at in a lot more detail in just a few moments. And moving on uh, to fossil fuel uh, consumption. Fossil, can you believe that? Oh. Fossil fuels are so polluting, not just carbon dioxide and urban smog, acid rain, but the
tiny particulates that uh, destroy people's lungs. Fossil fuels should be taxed to the hilt because they are so damaging to human health. And yet, fossil fuels are subsidized up to the hilt. You know, oil depletion allowances, coal, mine, uh, coal mines are hev heavily subsidized. That doesn't make sense. And the result is that people use more of the fossil fuels than they really need to, to support their lifestyles. The old United States in a class of its own, 5.6 tons of carbon per person in the year 2000. I love your country, this is my 94th visit. I look forward to many more visits, but boy, <laughs> there are lots of better ways you could uh, use your fossil fuels. The global level is 1.1. In Britain and Japan, 2.5 tons, that's less than half of the United States. Canada is a big country. People need to drive long distances there. Canada is a cold country. Don't say cold even in the northern of Vermont. They use an awful lot of fossil fuels for, for the heating. But even so, the amount is less per capita than it is in the United States. And the principal reason is that uh, fossil fuels are so heavily subsidized. Now, I wouldn't like you to think that I come to your country and I criticize you about this, that, and the other without uh, telling you something about how we screw up in Europe. And we screw up like royally there. It's a composite satellite photo taken at three o'clock in the middle of the night. Of course, there are hundreds of little satellite pictures there, all integrated into one. Three o'clock in the middle of the night. Note all those lights burning in Western Europe. At, in the middle of the night, there's almost all shop windows and advertising signs. And who's going to look at them at three o'clock in the middle of the night? Those lights are wasted. Of course, we need some street lighting for security and safety and so on. But 5% of those lights would serve that purpose. All, all those lights are, are wasted. It's, it's crazy, ridiculous. Those lights have well, electricity, of course, and electricity is almost always derived from burning of fossil fuels. There's an awful lot of global warming going on there in Western Europe in the, in the middle of the night. An awful lot of urban smog being generated and acid rain. And if we were to switch off those lights, we'd put money into our pockets. Obviously, it would be good for the economy, it would make the economy more streamlined, we would save. You might wonder why then do governments not switch off those silly lights? I don't have a good answer to that. Somebody once said it's because so many of those uh, governments are Marxist. Not Karl, but Groucho. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Uh, can you what, what should we do? Uh, for four quick items, uh, and I imagine most of you are familiar with these things, so we'll just go over them very quickly. First one, swap GNP for net national product, or an index of net sustainable welfare, or genuine progress indicator. You've uh, discussed all this at length in the Gund Institute. D does anybody not understand well, what, what those kinds of things mean? Fine, fine, fine. Well, well what else could I expect at the great University of uh, Vermont? Well, of course you all know about these things. Did you know, though, that uh, virtually all the alternative indicators show that whereas GNP has been climbing steadily ever onwards and upwards to the politicians' great delight, the other indicators almost all show that uh, things were getting better in terms of uh, lifestyle and uh, citizen welfare and so on. We're getting better until about 1980, but then they plattered out and during the 1990s they've almost all been going down. Now I'd like to ask you this, and I'd like to hear your views at the end of this talk. Would you go along with those enlightened economists, and there's one sitting right here, who would say that we've reached a stage where every one unit advance in the economy may well be purchased at the cost of a unit decline in human well-being? Now that is anathema to many mainstream traditional economists, and it's certainly anathema to, to the politicians. But what would you think that your lifestyle, your sense of personal fulfillment and happiness, to use a big word, does that really go up? Can you believe that uh, surveys were taken of uh, su surveys were taken in the United States about 1955? People were asked, "Are you happy?" That is, in terms of uh, relationships and uh, style of living and uh, level of material welfare and so on. And uh, the number of saying yes was only about 35 percent. Uh, similar surveys have been done every 10 years since the mid-1950s and even though people's incomes have been going up and up and up, the number of people saying they are happy has remained stuck at about 32-31%. We do badly need an alternative indicator in place of GNP uh, to, 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 to show how our economies are doing, <coughs> that is, how our economies 
truly increasing in terms of good things or are they increasing because of a, a lot of economic activities such as crime and uh, drugs and we also need to have a better lock on the thought does economic growth necessarily always lead to growth in human well-being? I think that's very questionable. In fact, as I've said, in some instances, human well-being is actually going down as the economy grows because the, when the economy advances, people have to work longer hours, they have less leisure time, they don't have as much time as they want to spend with their spouse, their kids, their neighbours, their, their, their friends. There's more pollution, there's more general rush, 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 frenzied, frantic lifestyles, more crime and so on. I'd like to hear your, your views later on. Do you think that if we can continue growing the economy in this country as it has been growing, that that will directly lead to greater personal welfare and so on, so on, so on. Number two, get the prices right, E.G. gasoline, petrol. So I'm going to show in a few moments' time. Uh, the price you pay for your gasoline is a long, long way from covering all the costs of burning that gallon of gasoline. Uh, you pay, what, $1.50 at the pump? There are a lot of, uh, un, a lot of costs that are not covered, like pollution, traffic accidents, and so on, which uh, add up to something over four dollars. So you should really be paying not a dollar fifty, but more like uh, five and a half dollars per gallon of gasoline. And kid yourselves not, those costs don't go away. They are being paid by somebody in society right now, and surely those costs should be paid by the driver of the automobile rather than the fellow citizen. Anyway, moving on. Number three, phase out perverse subsidies. We'll go into that in a lot more detail in a few moments. And then we've got uh, expand eco technologies. We'll give a look, we'll give some examples of that. Uh, what's this one thing? Oh, yes, perverse subsidies. There's a list there. Let's just have a look at a classic example first, and we'll come back to that. Classic example German coal mines. Let's just uh, have a read of that. You can read it, okay? Did you ever hear of anything so crazy? All these miners could go and sit on the back porch sipping beer for the rest of their lives on, on, on full, full, full salary. And I said, well, why does that happen then? Why does the German government behave in such a crazy way? Well, it's because the mines, the, the mining communities tend to live in parts of Germany which are crucial come election time. They live in the swing voting constituencies and so no political party, no politician is prepared to take on the, the miners and say, end of story, folks, you're going home, or we're closing down all the mines. No German politician will, will do that. Uh, going back a moment to this uh, list. There's an awful lot of these perverse substances in all kinds of fields. We can go into some in a little bit more detail, if you wish. But there's a book around, uh, one you could have a look at, uh, spelling all this out in some detail. Agriculture, $510 billion a year worldwide. And this has all kinds of downside uh, repercussions. Can, can it be that a... Uh, yeah, somebody said that a cow in the western United States, in those public rangelands, is subsidized to the extent of two dollars a day, which is uh, more than is the income of some three billion people worldwide. Better to be a cow living in Utah than, than to be a average person living in India or... Well. Anyway, uh, fossil fuels, we'll talk about that. Road transportation, we'll come back to a bit more detail. Water, we'll talk about that. Fisheries, forests. You now the total, almost two trillion dollars a year worldwide. And these are taxpayers' funds going down a rat hole of activities that are bad for the economy and bad for the environment. Now, there's been a tradition that says we need subsidies for this or that, and it may well be bad for the environment, but tough. As long as it's good for the economy, we must have those subsidies. But these are subsidies that are bad for the economy, as well as bad for the environment. Makes no sense. Two trillion dollars a year worldwide. And these are subsidies that, by definition, are fostering unsustainable development. Unsustainable economically, unsustainable environmentally. Two trillion dollars. Now this last bit. Uh, at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, a budget was presented for sustainable development, total of uh, $600 billion per year. And when the politicians of the world saw that figure, they threw up their hands and laughed. They said, 
We can't possibly find money of that order. This is crazy. Those environmentalists are going again. You know, it's, uh, they left it out of court. If they'd looked in the right place in those perverse subsidies, they'd have found three and a half times more than $600 billion. But then politicians aren't quite enough to, to think along those lines. And I'm quite, quite sure you yielded them. If those subsidies were to be phased out, there'd be a double dividend. We would do more to assist the environment, I believe, than through any other single measure, because it would phase out those activities that cause us to trash the environment. We, you know, we're, we're getting paid, we're being subsidized to wreck the environment. So it would be massively good for the environment. And it would also be good for the economy. These subsidies are so big that if they were phased out, most countries could, could eliminate their budget deficits at a stroke. They could increase their <coughs> budgets for education and for uh, health by at least 30%. At least 30 percent. And there'd be enough money left over to throw a week-long party for, for the whole country. Yeah. It'd, be, it'd be enormous for funds available. Fortunately, some countries have uh, made a start on phasing out some of their perverse subsidies, but there's a very, very long way to go. We've seen that one. I do. Oh, yes, energy waste. Have uh, a look at that. In particular, that figure at the end of the middle paragraph, $300 billion a year, which Americans are still wasted, wasting. There are almost 300 million people in the United States, so that's uh, $1,000 a year per person. Therefore, $1,000 per household. If you were to save that amount of energy, you'd save enough money to go off on a long weekend, well, on an extra week-long vacation in Hawaii. Be another double dividend. And what have we got here? Oh, yes. This is a summary of how these subsidies are bad economically. It's generally pretty plain how they are bad environmentally, not so clear straight off the, uh, what sort of damage they do to the economy. But, but they do slow down and distort the economy passively in all kinds of ways. I'm going to crash on because we're already coming up to uh, half time. Uh, consider the sector of road transportation and especially in this country. Uh, the top. Price now paid for a gallon of gasoline a dollar fifty. Total paid cost two hundred billion dollars a year. And then next item: costs of tax funds for road building, maintaining roads, highways, and so on, so on, uh, twenty-two cents and sixty-nine cents. So of course, well, when you pay a dollar fifty for your gallon of gasoline, some of that goes in tax to build more roads and to maintain existing roads and so on. But there's not nearly enough to do the job. Uh, so, uh, additional item of cost of tax funds. So Free parking, uh, worth about th 38 cents per gallon of gasoline. Well, why should people be uh, being able to park their cars at work for free? They're taking up space at the uh, expense of their fellow citizens. They should pay for that, <coughs> 38 cents. And then road congestion. You know, uh, people parking their cars at rush hour traffic when they should be at their workplace. It's a loss to the economy and uh, Gasoline is being used to, to no good purpose. Accidents, injuries and deaths, 47 cents. Military safeguards, 24 cents. That refers to a big uh, military task force that has been sitting in the Persian Gulf for the last uh, 30 years, long before Saddam Hussein started acting up. Big task force, mainly American military, but also some Europeans as well. Uh, and th that is funded by taxes, courtesy of taxpayers by and large. Those costs should be paid by the driver of the car, and not by all the fellow citizens. And then pollution, grand scale pollution, so on. Total per gallon, uh, $4.15. And that's a very conservative cost. And uh, th th this kind of arithmetic has been undertaken by several sets of independent economist teams in this country. So it's not just a case of one way out bunch of folks who've done the arithmetic. This has been confirmed by a good number of uh, leading economist groups in this country. Uh, you know, note that. So why don't taxpayers march on the mall and, uh, and protest? Well, mainly because they're, they're not aware that, they're, that some of their tax dollars are going down a rat hole of this, this kind of nonsense. In any case, uh, 
the costs are very diffused, whereas the benefits of these perverse subsidies tend to accrue to the oil firms, the car companies, just very small parts of the uh, small sectors of the economy. Oh, yes. Uh, there is some good news. Some governments have had the guts to bite the bullet and to say, well, well this is this is absurd. Let's uh, start to phase out these subsidies. But put all those together, it amounts to only about uh, a, sa a saving of about 5% of the $2 trillion a year worldwide. It's a long way to go. But this does demonstrate that the political obstacles in the way of uh, subsidy reform are not so insurmountable as you might suppose. That, that the, these perverse subsidies are bigger in the United States than in, than in any other country. Why aren't they being phased out? Well, because of the lobbyists who protect special interests, primarily these uh, perverse subsidies, and these lobbyists are at work in Washington w doing the rounds of Capitol Hill like crazy. Can you believe there are 80,000 of these lobbyists in Washington? And the amount of money they spend per month <coughs> to protect the perverse subsidies, in effect buying off the legislators, another word would be bribing them, the amount of money spent by these lobbyists is over $100 million every month. More power to John, Senator John McCain, who got a bill through the Senate after a lot of uh, pushing and shoving, going to uh, reform election campaign funding, which is when most money is spent on protecting these perverse subsidies. A long way to go yet. The biggest cost of all associated with these perverse subsidies is that they uh, promote old-style technologies which are wasteful, inefficient, drag on the economy. If, if let's say, fossil fuel wasn't being supported by, by massive subsidies, then they'd be placed in the open marketplace for wind power, solar energy, energy efficiency, and all kinds of other ways to supply ourselves with, with energy. But can you believe that for every one dollar of subsidy in this country that goes to wind power or solar energy, there are 12 or 15 dollars going to support fossil fuels, which is, again, ridiculous. Uh, fossil fuels are so polluting that it should be heavily taxed, but instead of that, they're, they're, they're propped up massively. If we were to get rid of these subsidies, then, then that would open the door for all kinds of, we might call, eco-technologies for pollution control, energy efficiency, and alternative energy recycling, you know, the, the long list of things. There, there are already technologies sitting on the shelf uh, that would give us twice as much material welfare for all people in the world while using only half as many raw materials and causing half as much pollution and waste. If you want to, to, see, how, to see that documented, have a look at a remarkable book, like a Bible of the Environment, by Paul Hawkin, Amy Lovins and Hunter Lovins called Natural Capitalism, published in 1999. They, ha they cite 100 examples of success stories demonstrating that these eco-technologies can deliver, they can do the job in terms of energy and raw materials. And moving on. Moving on. Oh, no. oh yes. Uh, an example of an eco-technology are the fluorescent light bulbs, which uh, cost more to purchase in the first place, but you get your money back by the end of the first year. They last ten times longer than an ordinary light bulb. They use only one quarter as much electricity. They light the... Uh, 1.3 billion such bulbs around the world uh, have eliminated the need for 20 kilofired power plants, saving an awful lot on CO2 emissions. And, so and uh, house buildings uh, can be much better insulated, and that would save on uh, electricity or, or heating, generally done with fossil fuels. This is the home and office of Amy and Hunter Lovins at 7,000 feet in the Canadian Rockies, where it is cold. There are 100 days when the temperature never, get, never gets above freezing in the middle of winter. Their total heating bill, because the house is so well insulated and they get some heating from the solar panels you see on the roof, their heating bill for the winter is nil. Can be done, can be done. We have the eco-technologies available. All, all we need to do is to get on with the job. I'm going to skip over this one because time is running out in a big way. Uh, and I do want to look at uh, oh yes, uh, here's some more eco-technologies that are being developed. All the research and the development uh, has been done, just a case of uh, putting them put to work in the marketplace. 
sorts of things. But w w when people see this list, they're inclined to say, oh, c come on, we, we don't really have such uh, miraculous devices that will deliver like this. Well, <laughs> let's beware of being unduly skeptical or cynical. This remark... It's remarkable how many people, how very many senior people, extremely educated and sophisticated people have come out with all kinds of statements in the past saying that this is not possible and something else can't be done and so on. Just have a look at this list here. This is one of the biggest roadblocks that people just don't believe that humans are smart and can do all kinds of clever things. If you want to, l you want to find hundreds of examples of this sort, have a look at the uh, Guinness Book of Guinness Book of Futile Prophecies, I think. Okay, moving on. All these will be on the, will be on the web. Uh, what have I got now? Oh yes. Moving on to a, to a different phase of this lecture, uh, how much time? Yeah. institutional roadblocks. They're the biggest one of all, are the perverse subsidies. But there are a lot of other roadblocks, like uh, people being cynical and they, they don't believe well, what, what is possible. These roadblocks are <coughs> extremely powerful. You know, consider public policy in this country or in any other country public policy in terms of, of the economy and technologies and this and that and po policy makers, political leaders seem to have an extraordinary talent for dropping the football in spectacular fashion in many different ways. I'd like to commend to your notice uh, a book which lays out just how capable governments are of making big boo-boos. It's a book by Barbara Duckman a popular historian in this country. She wrote a book called The March of Folly. She looks at 30 incidents in human history uh, when the political leaders had a choice. They could either go that way or they could go that way. And they knew that if they miscalled their choice, they'd not only cause a lot of damage to the economy or whatever, but they would bring the roof down on their heads. It would be catastrophic if they made the choice wrongly. The first such incident is the wooden horse of Troy. And you know all about that story, how the uh, Greeks uh, mis miscalled it and as a consequence lost the war. And then another example, uh, how Caesar screwed up in northwestern Europe and contributed to the decline of the Roman Empire. There's a long, long list of these things. Uh, in more recent times, there's a Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, which, he, which guaranteed that the Japanese would lose the war. <coughs> Stupid thing to do. And then there's the Vietnamese War. Again, the, the political leaders miscall the shots. Barbara Tuckman <coughs> asks, why is it that political leaders so regularly, so consistently, land themselves in the most frightful situations? Not, not just a bit of a setback, but bring the roof down on their heads. She says it's because institutions are not flexible enough to adapt to what human beings need. Well, that sounds a rather vacuous statement, but by institutions we mean government, the economy, banks, industry, academia, research centers, so on and so on. We'll have a look at some examples of this by in one or two sectors. This is the first time I've ever, I've ever done a lecture with, with, with this kind of material. I'd be very glad to hear your reactions. Scientific constraints. We live at a time, as I pointed out yesterday evening, when we are losing dozens of species every day, effectively losing them, uh, and within the lifetimes of most people sitting in this room, if we're carrying as we are, uh, we shall witness the loss of maybe half of all species that share this planet with us, the biggest in 65 million years, so on, so on, so on. You'd expect that, that biologists will be doing their utmost to research this phenomenon as fast as they can, trying to find out where the species is disappearing fastest, uh, what can we do about it, and so on. Let's have a look at the top line. In the last 50 years, there have been 7,000 uh, research theses or dissertations or agency reports on the white-tailed deer, 7,000. And that white-tailed deer is not an endangered species. On the contrary, it flourishes like a weed. There are far too many of the darn creature. We have to go out and shoot them to keep the numbers down. 
and yet biologists still keep researching every last abstruse aspect of this thing. Absurd, just a waste of time. And then the next one, new answers to old questions, new questions. Well, I'll explain that in a moment. The whole is thinking sideways, we can never do only one thing. Is this a question? That's, uh, scientists need, need to do, in my view, need to do much more uh, lateral thinking instead of the tunnel vision that some of them pursue, you know. They research more and more about less and less and until they know everything about nothing. But we need to expand our, our research horizons. Uh, is this a question? Uh, I took an entrance examination to Oxford University a long, long time ago and there was a general paper we had to write essays on a selection of topics. The first item was mandatory and the first item read, is this a question? Well, I looked at that and I froze. I thought, what on earth can I write in response to that? But I chewed on my pen and after a while I ground out two or three sides. At the end of the examination, as we were handing in our papers, I noticed that the girl sitting next to me had written just one line in response to that, to that question and then she'd gone on to item two. So when we got outside, I said to her, what did you write? And she said, she wrote, if this is a question, then this is an answer. <laughs> Period. <laughs> Line across the page. <laughs> and really, that's a perfect answer, isn't it? There's no answer better. She passed the exam and I flunked. Anyway. Yes, uh, scientists as advocates of... Uh, at a time of massive environmental crisis, our scientists should be getting out of their laboratories and going to Washington or the local political center and beating the drum and saying and dis describing what, what sort of trouble we're in. But many scientists, I won't say most scientists, but many scientists say that if they do that, they will be uh, degrading their professional objectivity. They're not supposed to engage in values. They're not supposed to say that the environmental crisis is somehow a bad thing and go and tell the politicians or, or the general public. Uh, I wish many more scientists would get into the public policy arena and make their views known. Then economic uh, blockages, first of all, discount rates. You know, the discount rate uh, reflects the opportunity cost of capital in the marketplace. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go and talk to uh, Bob Costanza and his colleagues, they'll tell you in a, in a couple of minutes. Discount rates. You know, that a uh, dollar in ten years' time is worth less to you than a, a dollar now because you have to wait for it and so the, its value is discounted. The system is such that uh, when the discount rate is 10%, as it often is, that is effectively saying that there's no future worth bothering about beyond seven years. Don't ask me why, you just uh, figure it out. And yet we're living at a time when uh, we are precipitating all kinds of adverse impacts of climate, uh, let's say, global warming, that won't arrive for, an, for another several decades, it won't arrive in their full clout for several decades. How do we discount that? What discount rate shall we invoke in the marketplace to, to, to determine how we shall spend our public funds? What kind of discount rate shall we invoke for something that, that won't arrive for a long time, but will then have a distinctly adverse effect on humankind for the next 1,000 years. How do we use a discount rate when we're talking about mass extinction of species which won't be repaired by evolution for at least 5 million years? We do not have the economic tools like discount rates to, that will remotely reflect the way the world works now with all these grand scale economic, uh, environmental problems. Economics uh, often doesn't reflect externalities you know, you buy a hamburger at, uh, with best quality for cheapest price, as I used to do in the 1960s when I was at Berkeley, not realizing that that hamburger beef might be raised on ranches in Central America, which have been established at the cost of the tropical rainforest. I didn't know that, and uh, but most consumers don't know that. These are what are called externalities, that is, spillover effects of, of what you do. We need to be much more aware. Uh, every Here's a challenge for you. This evening, when you're brushing your teeth, say to yourself, what have I consumed today and have I paid the full cost of producing that something, whatever it is? Might be a banana, a pair of jeans, a cup of coffee. It's quite likely that the price you paid is quite a long way of reflecting all the costs of its production. Externalities. 
then a list of other GNP and other indicators. We've talked about that tax system. Well, I can't go into all these things, but uh, th they will be up on, on the web, uh, as will some various papers of mine, and they'll explain what all this is about. Uh, political problems. Uh, politicians are extraordinarily ignorant about environmental concerns. In fact, they're so illiterate ecologically that they would think a food chain is a line of supermarkets. <laughs> but do they practice scientific ignorance or ignorance? Do they turn away from what they already know, but they prefer not to recognize because it would make, make life difficult for them? Do they understand interdisciplinary science? Hardly, hardly at all. Uh, lack of joined up government, you know, the department oh, in Britain uh, was supposed, well, consider, <laughs> consider this. Uh, in 1990, Margaret Thatcher uh, was informed by, actually George Woodwell, an American scientist, uh, uh, she was informed about global warming. And so Margaret Thatcher said, well, we, the British government, will do something about this. She called a cabinet meeting and banged the table, as was her wont, and said to her cabinet ministers, go out and do something about this. And then, on Tuesday, the Minister of Transport announced a huge new plan for building more freeways, that is, stimulating road transportation, CO2 emissions and so on. On Wednesday, the research office under the government that was researching new and renewable and clean source of energy had its budget slashed by 33%. And on Thursday, uh, there was a big tax break for business executives allowing them to have bigger and bigger cars and more CO2. On a Friday there was something else uh, like that. But very difficult to practice joined up government. That, uh, but then that, that happened in Britain where we had to put up with, uh, with a wishy-washy prime minister who couldn't make up her mind. Margaret Thatcher indeed. Anyway, the lack of joined up government. Moving on, let's have a look at another one. Oh, yes, uh, there are some breakthroughs. Yes, there are some, uh, there are some good news items, despite <coughs> these very widespread uh, institutional roadblocks. Pardon me. Okay. Uh, were you all here last night? I don't want to repeat the joke I made last night about the optimist and pessimist. You were all here, of course, of course, weren't you? Well, if you weren't, it's tough. You'll have to do without the joke. Ask your pals. <laughs> Birth rates in China. C can you believe that the fertility rate in China is now less than that in the United States? There have been some unfortunate aspects to it, but all the same, China has done a cracking good job in bringing its birth rate down. Thailand has done the same. In 1970, the average size family in uh, Thailand was five and a half children. And within 20 years, they brought it down to two children. So quite, quite extraordinary what's been done. Kenya, Iran, lots of countries have brought their birth rates cracking. Montreal Protocol, you know, the ozone layer thing. It was a miracle that 165 governments came up with a global treaty within just six months. But they did it. I'm sure they can do it. Factors 4 and 10, we talked about factor 4 earlier on. Factor 10 is on the cards if we mobilize all the eco-technologies available. Can you imagine getting 10 times more work out of every lump of coal or every last drop of oil or every last drop of water? 10 times more. Can be done. Can be done. Uh, of our substance talk about. Now note here, uh, that heading there is breakthroughs. Sometimes when I get a bit uh, downhearted about all this, I remind myself that there are times when politicians can get off their butts and do the right thing, even, at, if, even, if, even if it's a very courageous thing. In 1989, would you have taken on a bet that within 10 years we'd get rid of the Berlin Wall, communism, the Soviet Union, the Cold War, we'd get rid of apartheid in South Africa, we'd have talks on talks in Northern Ireland, the start of the peace movement. I thought we'd achieve that in 10 years, and yet we did all that in, in just three years. No limit to what politicians can do when, when they really set, set their mind to it. Can we learn from the above? Oh yes, uh, the, the media. Uh, one way to spread, to spread the word about the environment and the first subsidies and how we're reigning our economy and so on is by mobilizing soap operas. You know, slotting just a few words here and there so the viewer doesn't think they're being got at, but it's a very good way to educate people at the same time as uh, entertaining them. Finally, just have a look at this.
It is very difficult to shift public opinion, and especially all the entrenched interests that support an outdated and maybe destructive practice. But consider this. Uh, in the last 10 years, 55 million Americans have given up smoking. That's a majority of all adults who <coughs> used to smoke in this country. At the start of the period, if you wanted to be socially accepted, there'd be big pressures on you to smoke. And by the end of the period, if you wanted to be accepted socially, enormous pressures on you not to smoke. Well, all kinds of big breakthroughs available. Uh, Machiavelli, that uh, Italian prince a long time ago, down in Meadows, a uh, remarkable scientist who died just a little while ago. Folks, uh, I I've gone over a lot of ground rather quickly to try to demonstrate that there are huge deficiencies in the way we run our societies, our economies, but all these deficiencies can be fixed. On the whole, we know how to do it. All we have to do is to get on with the job. But first of all, be, become acquainted with the nature and scale of these problems, and that's what I've been trying to do in this talk. Now, Bob uh, told me I could talk for 45 minutes, and it's now 44 minutes and 53 seconds, so I'll stop there. Thank you. trade in your gas guzzling car and you, you want a more efficient one, you can go for the Toyota Pierce or the Honda Accord. Uh, the Office of the Department of Natural Resources on this campus has uh, bought a Toyota, uh, is it a Toyota Pierce? Uh, yes, which is very fuel efficient, it goes 50 miles to a gallon and so on, far less polluting, but it is more expensive to, to buy, alas. Well, the answer to that one is to persuade the government uh, to say that within three years all government vehicles will be these hybrids which are more efficient and less polluting and so on. That would create a, that would create a huge market for, for these things and that would drive down the, the price maybe by 30% within just uh, a couple of years. So that's one thing. Uh, uh, another thing which is not so... Well, now let me try to answer it uh, this way. When I first came to your country way back in 1967, I arrived on a Sunday and I saw at the airport the big piles of the New York S Sunday Times. And I thought, see, <laughs> well, what's, what's all this? Uh, and I thought, I, I will boycott that paper. I'm, I'm going to do my, my bit with it, right? But then after a while I thought, there, there are four, four million copies of that newspaper every Sunday and I'm just one. <laughs> well, what difference does that make? So I thought I'll persuade all my friends to boycott it. So I spent a lot of time talking and persuaded half a dozen of them. But again, half a dozen boycotts, well, what's it going to do? The only way to tackle that problem is by making common cause with millions of other people in the Sierra Club, Friends of the Earth, National Audubon and so on, who also want to, to save paper. It's not nearly so glamorous 
a lot of the environmental things we need to do are not very glamorous or sexy at all. I once spent a night in a jail. I once sat down in front of a bulldozer in Australia and uh, spent a night in a jail because of the, of the uh, Australian government. But on looking back, I think I could have achieved far more uh, during that 24 hours by sitting down and talking turkey with some government politician over a beer or two. It's not a very sexy thing to do. Anyway, next. In your paper, Institutional Roblox, you mentioned that one of the biggest problems with governments is their lack of long-term foresight and are operating as an organic whole. Do you think that one way to solve the problem would be to ensure that our president and high officials have a more holistic education in the arts, social sciences, humanities, and biological sciences as a qualification for their positions? Well, I would agree that uh, certain political leaders in this country, I won't name who, could... Uh, <laughs> could handle a little further education in, <laughs> in some respects. But what can I say? Uh, but politicians won't change their minds uh, in response to only one thing. You can give them a lot of new information which is very persuasive, but, but that won't help. The only thing they take notice of is public opinion and votes. Okay, we've got to put pressure on them somehow. You know, in this country, there are 25 million Americans who pay their $50 a year or whatever to be members of National Audubon or Sierra Club or so on. 25, that's uh, one household in... No, that's one American in 10, for goodness sake. Enormous number. And yet their, their impact on legislation is not nearly a fraction as much as it might be if you consider another organization in this country uh, which doesn't have nearly so many members but is enormously influential in terms of legislation, and that is the National Rifle Association. Now, I'm not going to say whether I'm in favor of gun control or, or, or not, but the National Rifle Association has only 2.5, 2.5 million members, that is one-tenth as many as the, all the environmentalists who were signed up in this country. Why don't the environmentalists do better? The NRA is extremely disciplined and organized. If something upsets them in Congress, and word goes out that they want uh, one million letters on Capitol Hill within 48 hours, those one million letters are forthcoming. And the, the legislators are scared stiff of losing so many votes. Because for every one person who writes a letter, they figure there are another 20 people out there who think the same thing but just don't get around to uh, writing a letter. Why can't the environmentalists be, be more organized, more disciplined? <laughs> they care about their cause just as much as the NRV, NRA people. Well, it's, well any, anyway. Well, what else to say on that? You mentioned that the reduction of subsidies was achieved in New Zealand, Russia, and other countries. How are these reductions achieved, and can the U.S. and other countries apply these lessons? Well, it was achieved because the political leaders in those countries uh, had the had the courage. I was going to use a different word, <laughs> anatomical word. No, let's say courage. They they had the guts of their their convictions to get on with it. In the case of New Zealand, and this was about 15 years ago, the, the national budget was being broken back because the subsidies to sheep farmers were so huge. And the government decided that they, did, they, they on the whole, they had public opinion behind them because the, the taxes to fund the subsidies were, were so huge. And within a year, they, they got rid of 99% of the subsidies. The sheep farmers kicked and screamed. They said, the that because they are the backbone of the economy, they said the country will go bankrupt and so on and so on. Today, there are more sheep farmers, more sheep, less environmental problems, uh, bigger exports, more revenues in the sheep industry than while the subsidies were there. Because when the sheep farmers didn't have the feather bedding of these subsidies and were exposed to the full rigors of the competitive marketplace, they got their act together and they, they learned how to run more sheep with less environmental damage, do it more sustainably, and so on and so on. It worked. In the case of Russia and the fossil fuel subsidies being slashed, well, that was due to the IMF and the World Bank saying, you do it by next Friday afternoon or else. And the, the leaders felt they had no alternative but, but to get on. And in all those instances, the economies are now better off because they are run more efficiently, at any rate, the energy sector is run more efficiently, there's more scope for wind power and the, uh, the other alternatives. The economy is more streamlined and it's worked, worked very well. 
if, if I had a million dollars to give to research, I certainly wouldn't give it to counting insects or biodiversity and stuff like that. I'd put it into trying to figure out what is the institutional chemistry, if you will, that has enabled these breakthroughs. How have the politicians been able to stand up to the special interests with their lobbying and their huge money? What gives? What, what, what makes it work? I, I don't know. Does, does anybody here have any idea at all? Why is it that when farmers in this country are less than half of 1% of the total population, President Bush gives them more and more subsidies year by year? Why should they be feather-bedded like that? Why don't they learn to make a living like the rest of you? Why is the farming lobby so politically powerful? I know Iowa has the first of the primaries and so on, but, but that's only a tiny part of the story, surely. Does anybody know? Yeah, but, but the main agricultural states are places like Iowa and Wisconsin, Minnesota and so on. They don't have a majority of votes in the Electoral College, do they? Well, then the electoral system needs to be changed. Maybe you've had 200 years of what the Founding Fathers uh, stipulated and it's served the country very well, but maybe we live in a different time. You know, most of those subsidies go to huge companies and corporations. Right. Right. It's a corporate subsidy. The subsidies are supplied in part to maintain this small farmer. But in fact, uh, the trend is the other way around. Uh, what is it? 80% uh, of the farm lands in this country are occupied by 20% of the farmers. The trend is altogether wrong. There are some farmers getting over $100,000 a year in subsidy who haven't set foot on a farm in the last 10 years. It's a, it's a very corrupt system. Yeah, yeah can't, right. You know, I first came here in the mid-1960s and I was very struck at what a democratic country this is. People can have their say, uh, there's free vote and you, independent judiciary and you can agitate through the newspapers, form public political parties, so it was marvellous. Much more democratic than any other country in the world. But now, I suspect the country is run by the 5% of the top of the pile who have the money to buy off the legislators, as happened last time. Your president wasn't, wasn't elected, he was selected. And I'm very sad to be saying that. Anyway, excellent. Uh, a lot of the questions we got focused on uh, corporations and what they have to do with institutional road uh, One of the big questions was, what is necessary to break down institutional road blocks and what outside force is necessary to overcome the inertia in politics? Well, I was saying about the NRA, they, they can mobilize a, a million letters in 48 hours. Why don't environmentalists uh, write letters? With a word process, it is so easy to bang off 10 lines saying, this is what I object to because of 1, 2, 3, 4, and what do you, Mr. Senator, plan to do about it? Let me know within 10 days or you lose my vote. You can write a letter like that, copy to the president, copy to the editor of your local newspaper, copy to the local mayor, or, or, all kinds of folks. All you do is bang a key on your word processor. Next week in, you can do the same thing again. They aren't going to check if you're using the, using the same words. Total exercise, for, for, total exercise five minutes a week. If, if people who care about the environment or these other issues were to send in their, their letters, it would make a world of difference. And by the way, <laughs> uh, when I was a student at Berkeley, the Vietnam War was at its height and I engaged in a letter writing campaign. A uh, politician said to us, write your letters on thick paper so many letters arrive at the White House that they don't have time even to count them, let alone to read them. But write them on thick. But the one thing they can do is to weigh the letters. So write on thick paper. <laughs> Does anybody have any better thoughts on how to break these log jams? How to stir, how to tackle the political inertia in this country? Yes. Right, 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 right. Don't wait for every four years when you go. Vote with your dollars every day. You know, you buy things several times a day. 
get hold of a book by the uh, Center for Economic something in New York. Anyway, it is called uh, Buying, Shopping for a Better America. Shopping for a Better America. It looks at uh, all kinds of products, like a bottle of milk, a can of beer, a pair of jeans, a shirt, a banana, a new car, and it assesses the principal manufacturers of these items in terms of environment, third world, gender issues, employment issues, all, all kinds of things. And you can figure out which are the good guys, and then vote with your dollars. It's been said time and time again that if all the 25 million environmentalists in this country, so, so, if just one tenth of them were to use just one tenth of their consumer dollars to support the good guys, then that would go a very long way to fixing the problem uh, overnight. Have you ever thought of that? Do it. You can vote to ten times a day. Would it changing the full cost of the price of water make it prohibitively expensive for some? How do you target those uh, that are wasteful without punishing those that are merely using for survival? Also can be uh, with gas prices too. Right, well, uh, I don't suppose there are any people in this country who are so desperately short of water that they get the disease that comes along, but there are a lot of people in developing countries to whom that applies. And in any case, in this country, could you not do as South Africa is doing, and China is doing, and Mexico is doing, and saying that it is a basic human right for every citizen to have a certain amount of water, maybe five gallons per day, which we five times more than they get right now. Everybody gets that for free. But if you want to have 15 gallons per day, well then you have to pay for the 10 on top of the basic 5. And if you want to wash your car and water a huge lawn, well, and that takes 50 gallons a day, you pay very highly for that. And if you want to have a swimming pool, fine, you can have 10 swimming pools. But you're going to pay through the nose for every drop of water in those swimming pools. Because every drop of water going there means a drop of water less for somebody on the wrong side of the railroad track who so doesn't have enough. If reverse subsidies were abolished, what would the transition period look like? Would in industries and businesses that depend on subsidies to pull profit collapse and lay off workers? Would some companies uh, slow production and lay off workers just to generate public op opposition to eliminating reverse subsidies? Did you all hear that? Okay. Yeah, you can't do, do, do these things overnight. It, it takes time. And it would be unfair to the industries to say, right, at the end of next month you have to change your ways or, or close down got to phase these things in slowly. Uh, if, uh, if we were to make this big transition from fossil fuels into clean and renewable source of energy, a lot of people in the oil industry and the coal, in coal industry will be thrown out of work. They have legitimate needs. But the money that is being saved, because the subsidies are no longer being funded, that supplies massive amounts of money to retrain those unemployed workers to go off and do, do something else. In certain sectors, like fisheries, they're going to have to do that anyway. Marine fisheries have been massively overexploited for decades. We had the instance in 1992 of the cod fishery off New England and Newfoundland. It was so rich in fish it could almost walk across the water, there's so many fish in there. But the fish had been overfished for so long, and that despite warnings, the fishermen kept, more and more fishermen kept on pursuing fewer and fewer fish, and in 1992 the fisher collapsed. Mm. Dozens of businesses went bankrupt, 32,000 fishermen became unemployed, and unemployment benefits have totaled over $4 billion. Well, if, if, you know, if they moved ahead of time, they would have had to pay out those $4 billion, but they could have found the $4 billion from somewhere and used that to retrain fishermen who would be out of work if the fishing fleets are being cut by a farm, so that fishing then became sustainable. It is a very, very valid point for a raise there, that these people, they, they, don't, they aren't mean-spirited when they go out and overfish. They're just exploiting a loophole in the way society ordains these things. They play by the rules of the game as laid down by society. And when they go bankrupt, well, they have money to be looked after. It can be done, though, because there'll be such huge amounts of money made available if, if tax dollars weren't needed to fund the subsidies. Well, I've said that three times. Oh, oh, sorry. Oh, next one. It's probably safe to say that the United States is a unique country. Uh, maybe not said in a good way anymore, but 
because we tend to have, or we perceive that we have a lot more freedom than other countries. Do you think that the principles that lower the birth rate in China can ever work in the United States, where people seem to think they have a lot of rights? Well, I hope the, me the methods that have been sometimes used in China would not be used anywhere else, and uh, they have pretty much come to an end in China. It's been a dreadful business. Uh, just digressing a moment. Uh, because of the one-child fam policy and the emphasis on boys, it turns out that an awful lot of females have disappeared in China. And that's because, uh, well, if a girl is born in some parts of China, the baby ends up in the local stream. That has happened. The Chinese now have those machines that can determine the sex of a child at three months, and if it's going to be a girl, then they practice feticide. According to Amartya Sen, the Nobel Prize winner in, econ in economics, in three countries, just China, India and Pakistan, 120 million females have disappeared in the last 20 years. They've dis well, they've not been born or they've been quietly d done away with. And the consequence of that is that in some Chinese cities now, at age 20, for every 100 women, there are 120 men looking for brides. It's going to cause all kinds of social upheavals. Anyway, that, that's that digression. Could, could, that ever, uh, could, could the Chinese methods ever apply in this country? I, I would hope not, not, not. But you could get down to, uh, well, your fertility rate is about 2.3 per, per reproductive woman, I think is one of the highest, it's the highest by quite a way of all the so-called rich nations. Oh, thank you. Okay, no, thank you, thank you. It's, a, it's, a, it's exceptionally high in this country. <laughs> to get... Okay. To get down to zero population growth, to get down to zero population growth, as concerns the women who are having babies and not counting the immigrants, all you have to do is to get, eliminate all the unwanted births that occur in this country. There are tens of thousands millions of unwanted births in this country every year, and yet you call yourselves a developed nation. In Britain, we still have tens of thousands of unwanted births every year. <laughs> what are the figures? Uh, One-third of, one of all conceptions are unwanted, and one, no, one-third of all pregnancies are unwanted, and one-third of those, are one-third of all births are unwanted. I don't know it in Britain, where we still have a population growth rate of uh, about 0.2%, which I think is shocking. We, we could get down unwanted births. Well, what to say? More education? More tolerance in public? Less uh, of the agitations by the... I'll choose my words carefully here. By the... Uh, moral majority, who are neither, but don't like abortions. I don't like abortions. I look forward to the day when there will be no more abortions of whatever sort. But this world is not going to be populated with saints and angels by next Friday afternoon. There will be accidents. There will be abortions. Can you figure that uh, the right to life people have pressured Congress so much about abortions and family planning generally in developing countries that the population budget under AID has been cut twice as much as for uh, aid overall. And the consequence of that is not only however many couples left unprotected in, in developing countries, no contraceptive facilities, and so many more unwanted births, but the consequence is millions more abortions every year in developing countries because of what the right to life people did they didn't stop to think. You can never do only one thing. End of story. It's, isn't it sudden tragic then? Let's the last question. Uh, make it a good Yeah. <laughs> All right. The news has become a center for entertainment, driven by a highly opinionated perspective. Many major corporations control most of the U.S. media. Different perspectives through local or nonprofit media allow the public to become more educated and informed. Could the government make good use of subsidi subsidies to encourage less mainstream media? 
Paul, that, 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 that gets into dangerous ground, doesn't it? The government funding educational programs, isn't that a Big Brother trying to manipulate what people should think? Isn't it better that that be left to, to the private world? Well, shouldn't government keep, keep out of that kind of thing? Except that. Well, here we go again. Well, uh, 1975, when I was in this country, I, I watched uh, tobacco adverts on television, and immediately after the tobacco advert, there'd be another one uh, by, by some publicly funded organization saying what was wrong with tobacco. It was called Fairness in Advertising. That seems to have disappeared. I don't see any of that sort on your screens now. Do you know why it's disappeared? Do you remember when there used to be Fairness in Advertising? Great shame that that went. Was that the last one? This one came from the audience. This is the one. Being English, what type of beer do you prefer? <laughs> what kind of what? What type of beer do you prefer? As much as possible. 